Welcome to the Corrections Disability Grant Overview. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being pre-recorded in case of any technical difficulties or other urgent matters, and the resource materials also will be posted on the grant website in a few days, and we will also share the link at the end of this webinar. To adjust your screen, look toward the top of the PowerPoint window, and you should see to the right an icon that looks like arrows pointed outward. And you may click on this icon to enlarge or reduce your viewing window. The resources that we'll reference, as you'll see in a window labeled Files 2, you may select each document title at a time and then click Download File. You should see a copy of the RFP, and there was a slight edit to that RFP, just so that you're aware, and also a copy of the Corrections Disability Grant Overview PowerPoint. So in this webinar, we'll go over the grant requirements some past recipients to showcase for you so you have an idea of the types of projects that have been funded in the past. Uh, just a quick review of the timeline and some questions and answers that we have listed on the webinar for you to um, take a look at. So with the Perkins Act, must be announced through the state register as a competitive grant. Institutional grant for direct services, it is not for individuals needing services, so that money cannot go directly to an individual. It can also include within the population those, disabil those with disabilities being served in correctional institutions or not. It can even um, serve, for example, youth who are in a transitional school, such as Hennepin County Home School. So the purpose of the grant is to expand outreach and services through you know, other community-focused organizations and agency partners, and to support those through expanded services and outreach to those underserved populations or new eligible groups within, say for example, homeless youth that are involved within corrections. They may not have been incarcerated within a juvenile facility. However, say for example, they may be on probation. So that court involvement is also something that is eligible for this particular grant. And again, it's about direct services to assist with career technical education services and activities for successful transitions into employment and further educational goals. So some other considerations to think about for this grant are that new goals and priorities for populations, we're looking at those who might be underserved. And again, I gave the example of homeless youth who may have some type of court involvement. But again, it's really about directly addressing career and technical education and preparation for employment and further training. So the other thing to consider is to make sure that this aligns and complements other initiatives to create a systemic impact on services and programs for these populations, not a one-time or annual event or program. It really should be about equity to provide tools for success in education and training. So again, uh, in the grant, you'll see that we talk about eligibility, and again, this is about direct services. So some examples would be community correction agencies. They also work with a lot of community organizations and schools. It could be transitional facilities for ex-offenders, ex for example. Could be other state programs, such as a few of them that we'll talk about um, later on within this program. So these are the four areas of required program emphasis. And for example, when we look at uh, work experience and functional literacy, we added work experience as another area because we want to make sure that we were addressing how to increase preparation of individuals with disabilities for employment or education and training. So some examples in these particular areas could be, it could be uh, 
activities and programs that include job shadowing, mentoring, work experience, developmental education cannot be supported with this funding. However, when it comes to technical reading and math for, say, some particular uh, career training areas where you know that students may need additional support, that would, would be considered. Um, assessment procedures could focus on guidance and support for transitions, maybe for those who have an IEP, that individual education plan. It is not for, funding cannot be used for developing those because there are other state and federal funds that assist with those with special needs when it comes to those educational plans, but it could su um, support programs. So as far as budget limitations, the edit that we made in the RFP to provide some more clarification is that 5% at a maximum of the grant funds received can go toward project management. So if you have someone, for example, that is going to be the project manager for this particular grant that you may receive, only 5% can be allocated in salaries and benefits. That does not mean the correction of the clarification, I should say, that we're making is funding can go toward trainers. We've had lots of organizations that either have trainers of their own where there's, there may be some support provided to them because this is above and beyond the work that they do. It could be for contracted um, employment to those who provide training services to you say through the college or maybe there are some other organizations. And again, administrative fees by law, I know that there are a lot of state agencies that may set aside between 5 and 10 percent or more for managing the particular grant. These federal funds, that those administrative fees for management are not allowed. And again, for um, indirect costs and overhead expenses, funding cannot be used for those things in this particular grant. One uh, note of caution, these Perkins funds cannot support elementary and middle school age um, youth for programs and services that you may provide. Only high school age and adult learners only. Again, middle school and elementary and preschool are not included in the, these federal funds. So here again is the timeline, again to remind you that May 18th is the deadline. Um, this year we have added um, a process where we do a pre-check. We take a look at the grant proposals, make sure that the budget is clear and in order and it is included, all the components of the questions and categories for the application have been included in the grant if there are any major questions. We're trying to allow some time to ask, to call and ask for clarification so that when we do the contract after the notifications of the award, we can move forward with the contract being uh, drafted between August and September because we'd like for these grants to go out no later than October. So here's an example list of some of the past recipients. And within this list, we have a number of different organizations. Some of them have been longtime partners with some of the colleges, some are not. Some work a lot with other community organizations and provide you know, career counseling and guidance and, and different types of activities for post-secondary education and skills training, including certification. Um, and it could be um, programs within state departments like the STAR program, uh, and we've had organizations like Goodwill Easter Seals, organizations that have worked with colleges um, where the organization may provide some type of skills training, say certified nurses assistant, for example, and they want to work on getting some articulated college credit so that their participants can take those credits and move on to a particular post-secondary institution and continue furthering their education with perhaps another certification or some type of degree. And some examples of some of the projects that these past recipients have done 
you know, have included job skills and it could be uh, mentoring, could be uh, job sampling where uh, youth or either adults may get a chance to learn about different career technical education programs, different uh, careers, kind of get a sense of what those careers are like. And it may be coupled with maybe some pre-employment training or other types of programs that will be connected with the grant project that has been proposed and awarded. It could be career training with articulated credits that I mentioned before. And again, developmental education is now allowed within this grant. One thing that I want to note on this example list is a camp. It's fine to have a summer camp, but the question is what other things are connected to this camp? Whether it's a series of events for the entire year, including a summer camp, or some other kind of experience during the year, so that it is not a one-time event. Here we have a couple of examples of some past recipients that also have websites with some of the um, tools and resources that they offer for uh, participants, whether it's those individuals with special needs or those who are um, with um, extra centers transitioning out of corrections. The Step Ahead program is with Goodwill Easter Seals. However, we have their resources on our CareerWise website. And CareerWise uh, used to be called ISEEC and has been redeveloped and, and expanded. And Tools for Your Future is with the STAR program, and that's for youth and adults with um, disabilities and some specific tools and resources um, directed toward them. So some questions that we received um, just recently and also continue to come up in the past as reoccurring um, questions that people have are whether or not Minnesota state institutions can apply. They are not eligible for this institutional grant, but that does not mean that they cannot be a partner. You may have a post-secondary institution that you've done a lot of partnering with on training, uh, could be um, diagnostic or assessments for those individuals with um, special needs that are coming to you for certain programs and services, for example. And, and again, it does serve youth or adults but it really pertains to those who are within a transitioning out of incarceration. One of the exceptions that I mentioned earlier is that you may have youth or adults, for example, youth in particular, that had been court involved, say uh, probation, but they've never been incarcerated. So that is another population that um, may be underserved that we would definitely consider as um, a potential project for funding. So a question that has come up many times is whether or not the entire population that serve must be, say, um, extra centers, for example. Clearly, there has to be some accountability and distinction between the funds that are being used for the population being served that are eligible under this particular grant and those who are within this general population for say, will say, what services are specifically for those who are, say, corrections or disabilities? Are there particular programs or services that are unique to their needs, such as employment barriers or other life skills that they may need that the general population who may go through certain pre-employment trainings and services that you already provide, what's going to distinguish one group from the other so that there's a separation of funds, there's no supplanting, and there's no double dipping on those funds. So again, we talked about supplanting, especially when it comes here about maintaining existing a program. We're really looking toward encouraging you on new and expanded services or other populations that have been underserved 
as we've mentioned in a couple of examples already, you do not have to have a post-secondary partner. But again, they can be a part of that. It could be training or, or some other kinds of career services and such that they may provide. It does not have to be an approved program by Minnesota Department of Education, for example, because these grants are not going toward a school or a school district. So again, if you have any other questions for this particular grant, you can feel free to contact us and I'll share the information. We do want you to know that not only if you have questions, but you have some ideas about how we can look at expanding the population served in consideration for this particular grant for services to corrections and disabilities, such as an underserved population, mental health, please let us know that as well. We want to make sure that this grant is relevant to the communities that we're trying to reach out to, but at the same time making sure that we're staying within the parameters of the Perkins legislation and what this grant was intended for. So if you have any technical questions about the online application, please make sure to contact Jared Reese, who's working with us on um, the website and the online application that has been posted. If you have any questions about the application or the content, and maybe some questions about um, some grant ideas that you have or partners and whether or not it would be eligible, please feel free to contact myself, Eva Case Winston, or you may also contact Geraldine Jargo, who is the State Director for Career Technical Education. And I do want to make an important note that after April 24th, 24th next Tuesday, I will be out on leave. So Geraldine Jargo will be the lead person if you have any questions about the application or want to talk to her about any ideas that you have for the proposal. Please feel free to contact her. So I definitely want to thank you for, for listening in on this webinar. I hope that the questions that we gave as examples to you, along with some of the past participants that have received a grant and some examples of some of the projects that they've done have been helpful to you. Listed here, you will see the grant website that will have this webinar posted and all the materials that we've talked about along with the grants already posted in the RFP and some of the, the updates that have been made to the RFP have been listed as well as the PowerPoint. So again, thank you for your time. I hope that you will consider applying for this grant and we look forward to hearing from you in the future.